So glad to see each and every one of you. Now, if you have a Bible with you this morning, I hope you do, open with me to Isaiah chapter 6. If you don't have a Bible, uh, don't worry, that'll be on the screen. Uh, so you can you can follow along with that. Uh, if this is your first time here, you are a guest, uh, and you are here maybe because of the big day. Maybe you came and you didn't even know it was a big day. You just like wandered in, and everybody's talking about what's the big day. Uh, we are just glad you're here. My name is Dallas Wilson, uh, and I'm the campus pastor here. I get the privilege of, of preaching the Word here on a weekly basis, and, man, I can't tell you how blessed me and my family are uh, to be here and to be able uh, to be a part of that. Um, now, here's what I want to do. Uh, you Normally, if you if you come... We're walking through a uh, text of Scripture at a time normally. Uh, we're walking in a series where we're, we leave one place one week and we'll kind of pick up there the next kind of deal, you know, uh, or we have a theme that's kind of sewing the series together. Today is different. Today is going to be uh, just a standalone kind of day. Uh, and I've asked you to turn your Bible to Isaiah chapter 6. The reason I asked you to turn there, uh, and this is going to be uh, to m- next week we'll be talking about something completely different, but Isaiah chapter 6 has been the most foundational passage uh, in my life, and I hope to be able to talk with you a little bit about why that's the case. Uh, so today, that's the, that's the text we're going to be looking, at, looking at. Uh, but I will forget to pray uh, if I keep going. So what I want to do is, before we go any further today, I'm going to pray for us, and then we'll we'll dive into the message. Okay? So pray with me, and then we'll and then we'll go into the message. Dear God, I pray over the next few minutes, Lord, that you would work among your people uh, in an awesome way. Dear God, I pray, Lord that you would do something in us that is unusual, God. I pray, Lord, uh, that you would take the foolish ramblings of a sinful man, dear God, and use them to the glory of your name, uh, and that we might know you more when we leave here and love you better. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Uh, The great uh, Genevan uh, reformer, John Calvin, he wrote uh, 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 what became a systematic theology that's one of the biggest uh, works in Christian history. It's like four or five books worth of work. You can buy this on Amazon uh, real cheap now. It, it, technology's come a long way, right? It's big old thick uh, systematic theology. And when John Calvin wrote this book, he opened his systematic theology with a line that, uh, that it, when I read this line, it changed uh, it changed the way I view how I want to live my life. And I, I'm going to read this quote to you. This is the way John Calvin, the great reformer uh, of the 1500s, uh, opened his systematic theology with this quote. It will be on the screen. It says, the, his words are this. Our wisdom, insofar as it ought to be deemed true and solid wisdom. So he's saying anything that we can consider real wisdom, like real knowledge about how to live life, consists almost entirely of two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of ourself. So John Calvin says, and I agree with this sentiment, that if you want to know how you should walk through life, if you want to have the knowledge and the wisdom to know how you should live, you've got to have two, two things, you've got to be able to answer two questions, two uh, areas of expertise. Number one, you've got to have knowledge of God, and number two, you've got to have knowledge of yourself. All right, the way I like to think about it is this. You get, in order to be able to get through life and understand how to live a full and meaningful life, you have to be able to answer two questions. And those two questions are this. Number one, who is God? And number two, who am I? And so uh, today, we're really going to have a sermon with two points in it. Now, I know some of you have been coming here a while, and you say, well, a two-point sermon, that means Dallas is going to preach shorter today. They're really long points, okay? So don't get excited, all right? But we're going to have a sermon with two points in it. The two points are this. The first question we're going to answer is, number one, who is God? And the second question we're going to answer uh, from Isaiah 6 is, is who are we? Uh, Now, the problem before we even dive into Isaiah 6, though, the problem in saying that in order to live a full life, in order to live a life full of wisdom, you've got to be able to answer the question, who is God and who are we, is that we live in a day and age where we do not have an accurate picture of either. We live in a day and an age in a society that does not have an accurate picture of either who God is or who we are. We live in a day and age in society, and, and this is really just the sinful tendency of human beings that, to, to shrink our view of God and elevate our view of ourselves. I love how J.I. Packer said this. J.I. Packer said, modern people 
though they cherish great thoughts of themselves, what's he saying? Though they, though they think really highly of themselves, have as a rule small thoughts about God. You see, we live in this world where we have to answer this question, who is God and who are we? The problem is our answer to those questions are wrong. The, our view of God and our view of ourselves are distorted. They're messed up. You see, what we've done in 2019 is we've made God in our image and we've made ourselves God. Let me explain that to you just a little bit. When I say we made ourselves and our, we've made God in our image, do you know the Bible says in Genesis 127 that when God created man and uh, woman, he said he created them in the image of God. That means that we are created to look like God. The problem is we were created to look like God, but instead we've taken ourselves and we've put ourselves in control and we've tried to form God to look more like us. So when it comes to things like sinful lifestyles or the way God says we should prioritize our life or order our life, we think God is like us and he really doesn't care what we live like or if we're pure or impure or how we spend our money or how we raise our kids because we've made God in our image. And then, on top of that, we've made ourselves God. The Bible says that God is the one being whom all of life is supposed to be ordered around. God is supposed to be the center of everything. Instead, we have made ourselves the center of everything. We are most important. We are what matters. So we've made God in our image and ourselves God. And the solution that I really want to dive into today and I really want to look at in Isaiah 6 has been so foundational in my life. I tell you, I, honestly, I can't tell you how often I come back to this passage. Whenever I'm feeling dry in my walk with Christ, whenever I need some reordering, I come back to this passage over and over again. The solution that I want us to draw from this passage today, I want us to do this. I want us to look at Isaiah 6 and I want us to see who God really is and subsequently I want us to be able to see who we really are. So with that in mind, read, if you got your Bibles, it'll be on the screen. If not, Isaiah 6, starting in verse 1, this is what the Bible says. In the, king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Isaiah's having a vision here of God. He was sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Let's take, let me take just a second right there and explain to you what the seraphim is. The seraphim are, nobody knows what they are. Okay? So literally, if you, if you take every Bible scholar in the world and you look at what they have to say on Isaiah chapter 6, all of them are going to have different answers as to what the seraphim actually are. The only thing we can actually equate them to is the, the seraphim are some kind of angel. Okay, They are some kind of being that exists in heaven for the worship of God. Verse 4, And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. So notice what's kind of going on here. Isaiah has had a vision of God sitting on a throne. And God, while he is sitting on the throne, there are angels worshiping him at all times. One calls to another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And then the other calls back, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Now, these beings, when they call, are so powerful that the Bible says the foundations of the threshold shook at their voice. Now, this is kind of a different dynamic than what we think about when we think about church, right? Because if, you, if you're having the vision Isaiah's having here, you're kind of scared, okay? But when we think about church, we're going, man, it's warm and bubbly and light. We want the feels, right? And how, I'm just blessed and glad to be here and smiles all around, right? That's not the image we have going on here in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah has found himself in a situation in which he is scared he's about to die. Look at verse 5. And I said, Isaiah says, when, he, when Isaiah sees God, this is his response. Woe is me, for I am lost. Anybody in here have the, um, the old King James Version of the Bible they're reading, or either New King James or Old King James Version of the Bible in front of you? If you do, I, I, I don't, I'm not doing this to shame you. I'm actually doing this because I think you have a better translation in this. Um, the, word, the word here 
says, uh, Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am lost. I love the way the old King James Version translates this word. It says, I am undone. We'll talk about why that's really important in just a second, but I like that word better. Woe is me, for I am undone. Look what he says. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of the people of unclean lips. I'm a sinner, and everybody else around me is a sinner too. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What's he saying? Woe is me. He's scared he's about to die right here. He says, woe is me. I'm a sinner, and my eyes have seen God. Verse 6, then one of the seraphim, one of the angels, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. Verse 7, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Here's what I want us to do. I want us to walk through this text, and I want us to answer two questions. The first question I want us to answer is, who is God? And the second I want us to answer is, who are we? All right, so let's, let's walk through this, and I'll explain to you as we go why this is so important that we answer this question. So Isaiah here has a good view to be able to answer this question. The qu- first question we're going to answer is, who is God? Isaiah here has the ability to answer this question because Isaiah is seeing God face to face here, okay? So we're going, I don't, here's the thing, I don't take this personally, I don't want to know what you think about God, okay? Because you may have an awesome quiet time, you may pray and read your Bible, and you may say God speaks to you, okay? I want to know what Isaiah says God is because Isaiah actually saw God here. So what's I, what does Isaiah, Isaiah, how does Isaiah answer this question, who is God? Here's the first thing I want you to see. If you're taking notes, there's going to be quite a few of these, so you can write them down. You don't have to, but uh, we're going to talk about who God is. The first thing I want you to know about God is this. God is alive. God is alive. Look at how this Bible, how the passage starts in Isaiah 6.1. The Bible says, in the year that King Uzziah died. All right, here's what you need to know. In uh, Israel, King Uzziah was one of the most famous and uh, most blessed by God kings that existed in Israel's history. He reigned in Judah for 53 years, and he brought great economic peace and prosperity and stability to the region. So when the Bible says that King Uzziah is dead, what we need to realize is that when this happens, the nation of Judah is concerned, right? They are worried because the king who has just bought them peace and prosperity is dead, and now they're wondering what they're going to do. But notice what Isaiah says. This is not about King Uzziah at all. Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. I love what God's doing here. God is using the the rule and reign of an earthly king to show his age, right? What is he saying? In the the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. King Uzziah is dead, but guess who's still alive and well? God. And what God is saying is long before King Uzziah ever came, I was alive. And guess what? Long after King Uzziah left, I'll still be here. And I I, I told this to the first service, and I want to speak this to you, and I want to speak this to you uh, with as much grace as possible and and not to encourage or discourage your civic duty at all. But as American Christians, we could learn a little bit from this. Right? Well, we live, we, and listen, I'm as patriotic as anybody, but we live in this place where we think America is, is the end all be all, right? And we've got to, and we got to vote and support our politicians and all this, and all that's true. But we could take a lesson from this because as American Christians, we need to understand that our duty is to vote, yes. But I think what we could learn is that far too often we put far too much stock into whoever's in the White House. Because guess what? God was alive long before America was even a thought. And long after America's gone, guess what? God's still going to be alive. And this should be a great comfort to you. I don't care what your stance is on what pre- whatever pre- president there is. Guess what? The president's going to leave office one day, and it doesn't matter who takes it next time or who takes it after that person. They, that When they die, God's still going to be alive. Because God is alive. That's what, that's what we need to see here. God is ageless. Before the king was ever a thought, God was. And now that King Uzziah is dead in this, in this sentence, God still is. God is alive. So many times we picture God as this distant force who has no interaction in our life, and he's almost a dead figure up there. And what Isaiah is saying is, I saw him. 
And he's not dead. He's alive. Next thing I want you to see is this. God is in control. God is in control. Look at, look at what the Bible says God's sitting there. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now, just a quick question, quiz. Who sits on a throne? Kings, right? Here, here's what I don't have in my home, a throne, right? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not in control. Kings sit on thrones. Now, here's what's, I, I mean, of course my wife lets me leave, you know what I mean? All right? I don't have a throne, though. God's sitting on a throne. And here's what I love. This is just, this is evidently a random time that Isaiah just popped into heaven, right? So Isaiah just pops into heaven, and guess what God's doing? Sitting there, reigning, in control, right? Now, here's what I love about this. If you were to pop into my home at a random time, you know what you'd find me doing? Running around like a chicken with my head cut off, washing dishes, folding clothes, cutting grass, any of those things, right? God's not doing any of that. You never find God in a situation of chaos. When you find God, he's sitting on a throne in control. I asked the first service this, and I, my, I pray that y'all relate to me with this. H how many of you guys have the one, what I call the once-a-month meltdown as a home? Anybody? Who knows what I'm talking about, right? If you're married, and you, especially if you're married with young kids, you know what I'm talking about, right? Here's what happens. Everything in life is going great, right? Man, you honestly, and you and your spouse probably even say to each other, like, we're killing it right now, right? Raising our kids well. Man, we're getting the kids to bed on time, cooking dinner, going to the gym. And here's what happens. A kid gets sick. And then chaos breaks loose for the next 36 hours, right? Then you finally get that fixed. And then something in your car breaks down, right? And then... Men, what happens, I know I, I, my wife was in the first service. She laughed at this because she knows it's true. What happens is you start to look at your wife, and you can tell, right? Her eye, the, the, t the tone in her eyes start to change, right? And she's starting to feel overwhelmed. But you, that you're, you're thinking, no, we got this. Remember, babe, we're killing it. We're awesome. We're doing it. And then you go another week, and what happens is your, wife's walk, your wife walks in the door, and she has a mental breakdown because life is going so crazy right now, right? Is that just me? Is that happening to anybody else? Once I set my clock, like after it happens, I'm like, okay, we got a month, right? Another, the next one happens. That happens in my house at least once a month, right? Because we're always working to be in control. We're always working to fix things. When we see God, though, we find him on a throne. And everything that he wants done is getting done. He's not worried. He's not perplexed. He's not in chaos. Things are just happening to his will. And here's what I love about this. The, it says it's high and lifted up. A guy named John Piper wrote a sermon on this, and I, I, didn't, I didn't catch this until I read what he said about it. He said the fact that God's throne is high and lifted up means that his throne is above every other throne. Here's what that means. There are a lot of kings and rulers and presidents in the world, and every one of them is under God's control. That should make you feel pretty comfortable. The Bible even says this. The Bible says in Proverbs that the, the heart of a king is like a river in the hands of the Lord. That when God wants to move it, he just moves it this way or that way. Can I just tell you, I know, and this might offend some of our sensibilities, but it is of great uh, enjoyment to me that whoever is in the White House, God is saying, you know what, I'm going to control this. I'm going to take care of this. Because the Bible says God is on a throne. He's high and lifted up. He is in control. So God is alive. God is in control. Here's the third thing I want you to see. I want you to see God is beautiful. God is beautiful. Look at what the Bible says. This is where, guys, honestly, this is going to get a little weird for us over the next little bit. Because the, Isaiah is about to use some imagery to describe God that we're just not familiar with. All right, look what it says in verse uh, in verse 1. The train of God's robe filled the temple. Ladies, can you help me out here? What is a train on? A wedding dress, right? Dudes, that, we're out, right? <laughs> I'm like, well, I had to look it up. I was like, is this the same thing, like a train on a wedding dress? And, and, and it is, it's the same word. When Isaiah sees God and he wants to convey to us what God looks like, 
the only thing that he can use to convey his majesty, to describe even the robe that God is wearing, is that God's robe was so majestic that the train of his robe filled the temple. This draws to mind for us imagery of a bride on her wedding day walking down the aisle and everybody in the sanctuary as I have their eyes fixed on one person. Can I just tell you, I was married, I got married six years ago and that we, we, the place was packed. Here's what I can assure you. Nobody knew what color tie I had on. Can I just be honest with you? I don't know what color tie I had on. Because when the doors opened and my wife walked through and I realized, like, my gosh, I actually get to marry her. Like, I actually looked at the preacher and was like, hey, man, hurry up or I promise she's going to change her mind. Like, she doesn't have good eyesight yet. She, we got to go to the doctor next week. Let's, fix, let's do this now, right? Because when she walked through, man, I, I cannot describe to you the sense of awe that came over the sanctuary because there was something majestic about the bride walking down to her groom, right? And it didn't have anything to do with the groom. That's what Isaiah, when he's trying to show us how beautiful God is, he said, thank, he, he said the train of his robe filled the temple. He's so majestic, he's so glorious, that his, he, our bride's trains fill the aisle, his train fills the temple. His, his beauty, his glory, his glory is unmatched. And then I want you to see, not only is he alive, not only is he in control, not only is he beautiful, he's worthy of worship. Look at what these seraphim here, these, these angels that go back and forth saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Can I just tell you, as I read this text, I feel kind of bad for the seraphim. I almost think these guys got the short end of the stick when they were drawing straws to see who did what job in heaven, right? I mean, think about it. You got guys that are, you got angels that are guarding the gates of heaven, probably. You got angels that are showing new, new people around heaven. And then you got these angels who are just going back and forth all day long saying the same thing over and over and over again. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. And, but here's what's amazing. These angels never grow tired of looking at and worshiping God. When they see God, they think they've got the best job in heaven because this is what they were created for, to look at God in all of his glory and say, look at him, he is great. The earth is filled with his glory. Holy, holy, holy. They never grow tired of it. They never want a new experience because each moment looking at God is better than the last. But yet we come in here on Sunday morning. And listen, I love you guys, but I love that I get to see all of you, right? So I see you. Some of us are scrolling through Facebook, right? I stand in the back when we worship sometimes and see some of it. This is really the guys, ladies, y'all don't do this. I see the guys breathe heavy, you know, and look around. They might throw their hand up. They put it back down really quick, though, because they don't want anybody to see them. We come in here, and we have such a hard time even opening our mouths to contribute to the lyrics of the songs that we're singing. These angels worship all day long. We struggle to do it for an hour. I can't help but think sometimes that the reason we struggle so much with worship is because we have yet to realize who we are worshiping. This God is worthy of worship. So much so that there are beings created in heaven who sing of his praises all day long. Then the last thing I want you to see about God is this. God is holy. Look at what the Bible says in 6.3. One called to another and said, Holy Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. You know, this is the only uh, threefold superlative in Scripture. And the Hebrew language has a lot of superlatives, if you go back and read it in the original language, because the Hebrew language, there was nothing to describe, to put emphasis on a word except the repetition of a word. So if you wanted to describe a deep hole, you wouldn't say deep hole. What you would say is whole hole, right? And what you were emphasizing is that this, it's a big hole, right? It's a great hole. It's a large hole. So in the, in the Hebrew language, when you want to emphasize something, you repeat it. And notice what the angels do here. They don't repeat it just once. They repeat it twice for good measure. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Now, what, is, what does holy mean? Holiness is God's otherness. 
To be holy means to be set apart, to be different, to be unlike anything else. So when these angels are going back and forth and they're singing the praise of God for eternity, what they're saying to each other is different, different, different. Not like me, not like you, different. God's holiness is the essence of what it means for him to be God. You know, of all the attributes of God here, they could have said anything. They could have said, the angels could be going back and forth and saying, God, love, love, love. It's not what they say. They could be going back and forth. And they could be saying, power, power, power. That's not what they're saying. When they, when they choose one word to worship God with for all of eternity, that one word is holiness. Holy, 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 praise God. You are not like me. You are different. And so, I know this is a different type of message. As our time winds down here, you may be even wondering why I would take 30 minutes to preach a message to you just about who God is. Because the reality is, I have not given you one practical thing that you could leave here with today. If you, are, if you came here hoping to get like five tips today to, to improve your marriage, like you're leaving mad, Right? You're like, this dude just preached on who God was for 30 minutes and hadn't tell me anything about how to fix my marriage. I want you to know that answering this question, who is God, is going to be the most practical thing you can do in your life. I want, I'll, I'll, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. How you see God determines everything in your life. I'm going to repeat that just so you, you can, because oh, I'm going to give you a couple of illustrations, but I want you to know. How you see God determines everything in your life. How you see God determines how you handle the news of the diagnosis that you didn't want to get. So the doctor walks in, says, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's cancer, and it's worse than we thought. In that moment, how you see God determines your response. Real practical. How you see God determines how you argue with your spouse. Can I just tell you, and listen, some of y'all are like, he talks about his wife a lot. She was in here in the first service, I promise. She, she heard it. And she, she may get mad at me later, but I really doubt it. Um, how you see God determines how you argue with your spouse. Can I just tell you, there have been so many times me and Jenna are bickering back and forth, and the thought of who God is comes into my mind. And there is something on my tongue that I just, I want to say it. I, and I'm, right? And but when I realize who God is, it affects how I argue with my spouse. How you view God determines how you wake up in the morning and how you go to bed. How you view God determines how you raise your children and how you love your coworkers. How you view God is the most important thing about you. I love Tozer says it this way. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important important thing about us because here's why you will never rise above how you view God you will never love someone more than you view your view of God as love you will never kill sin more than you think God is holy you will never be nicer to a co-worker more than you realize God has been kind to you how you see God determines everything in your life which leads us to the second question and this is what I'm going to close with. Who are we? So if that's who God is, who are we? Look at verse 5. When Isaiah sees God, he answers the question for us of who are we. Verse 5, he says this, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. The answer to the question, most fundamentally, of who are we, or who am I, is this. We are, I am, a sinner. We are sinful. Notice what happens here when Isaiah sees God. He has seen God face to face, and in contrast with what he sees about God, what he thinks about God, the only thing he can respond with is, God is holy, and I am sinful, I'm about to die. 
Because once you have seen the holiness of God, you realize how sinful you actually are. And look, look what Isaiah says he is sent where he is most sinful. What's he say? I am a man of unclean lips. Let me explain to you why that's really important. Isaiah was a prophet. The most valuable thing Isaiah had to offer were his lips. It's like it's equivalent of me being a preacher here today. The most valuable thing I can offer God right now is this, is this voice. If I were to go mute, literally I don't have anything else to offer God in this moment, right? Somebody else had to come up, look at the notes, try to make sense of it and finish it out. But Isaiah says his most valuable thing before God, he says, it is unclean. He says, the best I have to offer you, God, is unclean. When we realize who God is and how powerful he is and how holy he is, we realize that our best deeds before God's righteousness are like filthy rags. He says, the best I have to offer is unclean. And notice his response. I am lost. I told you guys that I like the word better of undone. And it gives a better sense of what Isaiah is actually trying to convey here. The Hebrew word for I am lost, I am undone, it conveys a sense of falling apart. It conveys a sense of literally you are here, but you are having a psychological breakdown. You are literally falling apart in front of somebody. Anybody ever seen the uh, the Avengers movies, the Infinity War, uh, Endgame? Yeah, no? All right, if you haven't seen it, a new church down the road. Go, go, no, I'm just kidding. But if you've seen, if you've seen Avengers, there's this part at the end of the movie, right, where they've been trying to catch up to Thanos the whole time, right? And uh, Thor comes down, right, and he hits him with the axe, but that, he didn't, he didn't chop off his hand, right? And so when he snaps his finger, what happens? These people begin to to fall apart. These people begin to disintegrate. When Isaiah sees God, his response to the holiness of God is that that I am about to fall apart because I am sinful, dear God, and you are holy. So that I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but since I'm up here and I'm the preacher, I just want to tell you, you are no better off than Isaiah. Before the holiness of God, the best that you can bring before him is filthy rags. And I just can't help but wonder, have you ever had the time in your life where you've looked at God and you've been broken over your sin like Isaiah is here. That you look at God and you say, God, before you, I am nothing and I deserve to die. Can I just tell you, if you have never had that moment, then you've never actually seen God. Because once we see God, that's the response. So we are sinful. The second thing I want you to see about who we are is this. We are sinful, but praise God, We can be forgiven. Look what happens in verse 6 through 7. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. This is the first moment in the whole story that we see one of the angels start doing something other than worship. At God's direction, they go down to the altar and they grab a coal from the altar. And verse 7 says, He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, This has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Now, you've got to understand a little bit here about what's going on with the deal, the altar and whatnot and all that. There is no such thing as free forgiveness. Forgiveness is going to always cost somebody something. Since the beginning of the fall, when Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, forgiveness has always cost something because when there is sin... Because God is a just God and a fair God, someone must pay for the sin. However, God, being rich in mercy, said and made a deal that instead of us paying for the sin that we deserve, he would take our punishment and place it on someone else. So in the Old Testament, we have this idea of offering sacrifices on the altar, right? And so you'd offer the sacrifice, the blood of the sacrifice would drip down on these coals. And what this is, is this is a foreshadowing of the sacrifice that was to come. That in the Old Testament, you could sacrifice an animal, and that blood would be, the the blood of the sacrifice would be your forgiveness. In the New Testament, we understand that Jesus Christ himself has come to be the sacrifice, and in his blood, sin has been atoned for once and for all, if we believe. So the blood here that when Isaiah, when the 
person, when the angel takes the, uh, the, the coal and puts it to his lips, the blood of the sacrifice that is dripped down on the altar is not really the blood of the animal at all. It's the blood of Jesus Christ. And here's what we need to know. Here's what I want you to know. You are in the same sinful situation that Isaiah found himself in. But you can have the same blood from the same sacrifice atoned for your sins like Isaiah had his sins atoned for. You can be forgiven. All that you have to do is, like Isaiah, recognize your brokenness and call out for the blood. Praise God, we are sinful, but we can be forgiven. And here's the last thing I want you to see. We have a purpose. Look with me at verse 8. We didn't read this just a second ago. So Isaiah now has realized that he is sinful. He has realized that he can be forgiven. And now God calls out and he says, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? So now after all this is done, God literally calls out over heaven and he says, I have a job that needs to be done. And Isaiah's response is like that of a fourth grade child once their teacher has asked the question, right? You can just see Isaiah in the crowd. He's just... God, me, the one who you just forgave, God, me, right? That's Isaiah's response here. Look what he says. Here am I, send me. Isaiah has gone from woe is me to here am I. And here's what I need you to know. God is like a hurricane of grace towards us. When God calls us out and calls us in to forgive us, he never calls us out without sending us out. Because if we are sinful, but we are forgiven, we have a purpose. And that purpose is to go into the world and make the name and the glory of Jesus Christ above all. Because if you have experienced the grace of God and forgiveness of your sins, you cannot help but want to lavish the grace of God on others. And so, listen, I know this is not your typical sermon today. I know looking at these two questions, who am I, who is God, it's way different than what we normally do. But here's what I want to do. I want to offer you a chance to respond to it. And maybe in hearing something different, God just pricked your heart. So I, if we can do something a little bit different, I want to ask you, would you bow your head with me? And we're going to pray for a few minutes. And I, I just want to offer you a chance to pray. Everybody, uh, all, all eyes closed, every head bowed. The worship band is going to go ahead and make their way up on stage while I'm doing this. You just ignore them. They're there not going to distract you right now. If every head's bowed, every eye's closed, I want to offer you a couple things. Number one, maybe you're here this morning and you are like Isaiah. You would say, I realize that I am sinful and that I need the blood of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ to atone for my sins. But you've never called out to Jesus for that personally. This morning, I would ask you, if that's you, would you do me a favor? Would you take the card that you were handed on your way in as, as a worship guide on that card, there's an option that says something like, I would like to follow Jesus Christ uh, for the first time, or personally. If you want to follow Jesus today, you would say, I'm calling out to Jesus Christ for salvation. I'm calling out to him to, to forgive me of my sins. Would you fill that card out with your information and check that box and turn it into one of our host team members and give me an opportunity to follow up with you? I would love to be able to tell you and, and, and pray with you about how you can follow Christ. The second thing is for those of us who are believers, I want to offer us just a few seconds of prayer because here's the reality. It would be a shame if like Isaiah, we had experienced the grace of God, but unlike Isaiah, we had not been living on mission for God. And so for just 30 seconds or so, would you pray and just ask God, maybe, maybe it's a time of repentance and just asking God to refocus you on mission, or maybe it's you calling out to God for salvation. I want to give you time to do that right now for, for just a few seconds. Would you pray, and then I'll close us in just a moment. God, you are Lord above all, King of the universe, high and lifted up on your throne. God, I know what you did for me when you showed me who you really are. And I pray that you would show us that again today. I pray that you would use the sinful ramblings of a man to glorify yourself. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.